Hey guys, welcome back to Get It Garage. My name is Mike. If you are not familiar with the channel, we are uh, in the process of doing some work on our CRD Jeep Liberty here. Um, we're actually doing a transmission cooler on it. We have uh, kind of mocked up here on a little bracket that I made and another one down here on the bottom. And essentially, I did a bunch of research to try and figure out the best way in order to install an aftermarket transmission cooler. And in the process, I came up with a little bit of information that I wasn't aware of. So what I found was uh, a transmission cooler installed upside down can potentially cause air leaks or uh, air gaps inside of the cooler, uh, which is now a compressible gas, which can exceed the pressure ratings for the cooler itself and the lines and all that kind of stuff. And we had some leaky lines on this, so I suspected that was what maybe caused it. There was no rust or anything like that in the lines. They were in pretty good shape, but they were still uh, they were still leaking in different spots. Somebody had also installed an aftermarket transmission cooler on this, which I'm going to show you. They installed it in line with the old one. You can see right here, maybe. They uh, actually just used hose clamps and hose clamps over here as well to... Uh, hook it all up and the hose clamps are not holding and it is actually leaking. You may even be able to see down in there a little bit the aftermarket transmission cooler that was in here before, right here. And it's uh, pretty loose in there. It's not really being held up and it's just got rubber hoses holding it. I, I don't like anything about it and it's leaking as you can see here. There's grease all over everything. So one of the reasons we noticed that it was even leaking to begin with is because we did get a, uh, a pro vent installed on our Jeep. Check out that video. Uh, go ahead and click the link up there for our ProVent install. So, basically what we got here is an aftermarket cooler. And uh, on the top of this cooler, we have uh, what are called AN fittings. Now, if you're not familiar with these, uh, it's an Army-Navy size. And they developed this a long time ago for uh, airplanes and whatnot. So, I guess it's supposed to be pretty good. I use Dash 6, which is the size that they specify. And on the Dash 6, uh, it's a 3 8 internal diameter so with a 3 8 internal diameter there we're going to be running the same size as the stock lines were before up to a, a cooler we're going to actually eliminate the stock transmission cooler completely because it's actually installed upside down which can cause those air pockets as is the aftermarket one that was put on here it's also installed upside down with both of the inlet and outlet at the bottom so when the car is off the vehicle's off it can drain down and then cause air pockets up at the top which is what I'm trying to avoid here. So we're going to install ours with both of the lines facing upward. So in theory, it should fill this up and it should remain full and we won't get any air bubbles or anything like that. Hopefully this fixes the problem with this Jeep. Um, the lines are AN. I've never actually made them before. Uh, this is an AN fitting. Basically this comes apart and you screw one end onto the end of your hose and then you screw the rest of it back down on there. And I'll show you how to make one of those when we go to do it. Now, I did spend probably about $250 on all the parts for this. I'll leave some links in the description if you're interested. The CNR Racing uh, transmission cooler we got was about $80 after shipping and everything. It was one of the more expensive parts. Uh, the line was also pretty expensive. I went with stainless steel braided dash 6 AN line. 3 8 internal diameter and stainless steel braided on the outside. I actually bought it twice. I bought a piece from Summit Racing, which was about 85 bucks, and I bought a piece locally, which was about half price of that. If you are thinking about doing something like this, um, probably you're going to be able to get a really good deal locally rather than ordering this type of line online. These are some of the other parts that I purchased uh, in order to do this job. Uh, this right here is just a piece of the line that I cut off while I was trying to fix the leaks uh, unsuccessfully I might add so now we're gonna do it the right way so this is the line that we have coming out of the transmission and there is not enough room between the transmission and the transmission tunnel to actually get in there and put in your own fittings so what I came up with was I was going to go down there and cut these lines maybe, I don't know, six to eight inches away from the transmission after they uh, make the bends and everything. And I'm going to put a flare on there. So this is the flare nut. You have to put this on first and then use a tool to flare this out a little bit so that the nut doesn't back off. And then from this, I have this adapter from Russell Performance uh, uh, fittings here. And I got this from Summit as well. And these will screw right into here and kind of sandwich that little flare in there with it looking like this. And then once you have this, we have a, uh, this is also a dash six AN fitting, which is the same as we're using on the other side. And this is the end that goes right on here. So this will do the adapt from the AN to the line. 
So then we go from hard line right to stainless steel braided line with two adapters and a flare fitting. This was the easiest and cheapest way that I was able to figure out how to do it rather than bringing the lines into a custom shop to make the lines. This was the DIY method I should, I would say. That is how it's going to look under the car. I just have to get down there and cut the lines and flare the fitting. So we're gonna do that first. Okay, so we are under the Jeep now and we are right behind the oil filter. We have our two transmission lines right here. Now, if you are running uh, aftermarket transmission cooler, uh, you're gonna wanna make sure that you, if you keep your stock one, you're gonna wanna make sure that you put your uh, aftermarket on your return line. I'm not sure which one that is, but in my case, I'm running an aftermarket uh, without the stock one. I'm going to eliminate that. I am going to uh, not have to worry about whether or not uh, I install it which way. It doesn't really matter. But what I got here is just a, a little tubing cutter. And this is nice because they can kind of fit in between the lines. So if you need to, to get in there to cut them, uh, there's room to spin it around the lines. So these are really handy for a job like this. There's a little bit of room to get this in there. I'm going to do the splice right here. It's an easy spot to get to. Yeah, it does probably have fluid in it. It does have fluid in it at this point. I did not drain any fluid out for any of this. Now, you don't want to go too close to the corner because you have to do have to have room to get on here to make your flare. I'm going to have to take that into account here and make sure that I don't go too far back. I think I'm going to make my cut right here before the line starts to get rusty so that way I can kind of eliminate this bad spot of the line. I would much rather uh, do that. Uh, another modification that I do plan to do at some point is you can buy aftermarket uh, lines for this Jeep and they do have stainless steel ones. Uh, I will upgrade to those and cut them back to here eventually. So this part right here will also be brand new stainless steel. I just did not get it at this point. I wanted to get this repair done with the least amount of expense possible at least at first. So all right, we do have two clips like this on the hard lines that exist on the Jeep. There may even be more. My, I'm not sure if I was missing one or not. You remove these and you can get more access to uh, get your pipe cutter in there to, you know, get the... This one was actually uh, back a little bit and then there's another one right in front of the uh, front axle. So it's like right up in here. That'll get them nice and loose. As you can see here, they're moving around quite a bit. So we should have plenty of room to get in there and cut those out. I'm going to try and do everything while it's still attached to the transmission here. I don't know if that's going to be a, the best option here. I may end up having to take these lines out. At the very least, I figured I owe myself to try and see if we can do it without taking them out. There's not a lot of room up there. There it goes. There's one line. It smells transmission-y. See, and as you can see here, we don't have a lot of fluid in the lines, which seems pretty good. This side right here that's leaking is this is coming from the transmission cooler. So uh, this is uh, going to have to go anyway. And it's a nice clean cut, too, with these. You don't want to use a, a Sawzall or anything like that. All right, so we're back on the front of the Jeep now, and we're gonna go ahead and remove the, the stock lines here. Now, yours may look a little bit different because I do have a aftermarket one that's been installed in here previously that I have to take out. Yours may be a little bit different, but these connections to the bottom of the transmission cooler here are gonna be the same for you. So there's this little piece of plastic that covers it, and you can just pull that back off. The top of this is the AC condenser. The bottom of it is the transmission cooler. It's a bit of information there. You can't actually remove this from the vehicle. You need it. But there is a special tool to get in here and take this out. This is a, a little bit loose already. You can get a screwdriver or a little pick or something up underneath this. Pry this little clip out from the back. You're going to want to make sure you save this if you're going to be reusing any of these parts. Get that little clip out. And then this line will come right out. There we go. There's one side. And this is actually all loose now, so I should be able to pull it through. There. There we go. Now we should be able to pull this out. All right, I'm just doing the same thing here to the other side. There isn't really a lot of room to get a good shot in here, but it's exactly the same. Uh, I got a hose clamp in my way, but to yours should be uh, should be identical. If you can't get these off, you can unscrew the, the main connections there, and it'll kind of just spin on the, uh, on the fitting, kind of like a flare almost. So there's also that way of taking it off if you can't get this way. All right, so we gotta finagle these lines out of here now. These are the two coming from the back. Actually, one of these is going to my uh, old cooler here, which is up tucked in between the intercooler and the radiator. So I'm gonna pull that out, disconnect the lines, and get all these old lines out of the way. And then we can start running the new ones and making our flares. 
We're about to pull out the uh, aftermarket transmission cooler that was in here. But one thing that I, I'm just going to note here too is right now the lines going to it are pointed down and they just drained into the oil pan. If you have your transmission cooler with the lines pointed up, every time you have to get into your transmission uh, cooling system, you're not going to have to drain all of that fluid out of your transmission cooler. It's going to stay in there. I mean, unless it siphons out by some sort of weird magic, it should stay in there. But I'm going to just pull this thing out. And you can hear it. It's just jammed in between there. And it just looks horrible and like, oh, what is that? A piece of duct tape? Yeah, it was held in with duct tape. Okay, that makes sense. So that's the old transmission cooler. All the fins are bent on it. It was jammed in there. I mean, this is probably getting about, I would say, 80% cooling with all these bent fins on here. And that's compared to the size of the one that uh, we bought. It's about the same size, so I, I feel good about that. However, this was just, uh, I, I didn't like it at all. It was basically installed like this inside the vehicle and the transmission cooler lines coming out of the bottom. So I'm going to be glad to see this go. All right, so this is the piece that I got out of the transmission cooler, the stock one on the AC condenser. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to just cut this off and bend it over, fold it over so that it's closed and then put the clip back in there and put it all back in place just to keep it so that it's closed. I don't think it's going to hurt anything, but I don't want it to damage my AC condenser at all. And I, I don't think it will. I'm pretty sure they're two separate systems in the same core. So we're just gonna put that back in there, eliminate any possible problems. All right, so we are looking at our transmission cooler lines as they attach to the transmission. And as you can see, there are those little plastic clips on them as well. So I think the best situation here would be for me to actually remove these lines rather than try to flare them in place. I just did a test flare on a spare piece and it came out well. However, the forces that I needed to apply with my tool were too great for me to really feel like I could do this comfortably up here inside of the transmission tunnel and everything. So I'm going to pop those little white clips off. They should remove exactly the same way as the ones for the transmission cooler up front. There should be a little clip in there. I'm going to do that and take these out and then I'll show you making the flares. So I'm going to show you how to do a flare how I was taught how to do one. Now it kind of depends on the tool that you have here. Um, this is not the most expensive tool but it will work just fine. I would like to get a nicer one for flaring brake lines and all kinds of stuff like that. Eastwood sponsor me. Um, just throwing that out there. So you're going to want to clamp this down in there. And the way that I was told how to do it is to, uh, depending on what end you're putting your pipe in initially here, you're going to want to tighten that one down first. So you loosen this all the way up and you tighten this one down. In the process, it kind of pivots around the pipe and you get a bigger gap over on the opposite end. That means that you, when you tighten this down, you're really going to cramp, clamp that down really good. You're going to have a lot of leverage to help, you know, squeeze that in there so it doesn't slip out. The next thing you're going to need to do is you're going to need this tool. Uh, it usually comes with the kits. You use this thickness right here to kind of just how far out that is supposed to stick and it looks like I got it pretty close on the first time I'm gonna push it in just a little bit uh, it doesn't really need to stick out quite as far I noticed if it's a little bit shorter it seems to be better below the thickness of this right here so I think that should be good then you're gonna to want to tighten down this side because it's the closest and the gap over here will open up so then you can really crank this down good and get a nice good clamp with minimal effort. Now that is going to be sure to stay in there and not come out while you're doing the flare. Another thing that's really helpful is to clamp your flaring tool on the vise, which is why we're even over here. So that way it's kind of like just being held in place while you crank on it and it's not going anywhere. You got to take your tool, stick it in there, and we'll use the flaring tool here now to do the first part of it, which is just like the, I guess it's the bubble flare. I'm not really sure if it's got a name. Get it centered and then crank this thing down. And this is the part I was talking about. There's too much too many forces involved here to do this reliably under the vehicle. I mean, in reality, that's what these things are made for, so you can kind of put them wherever you need to, but it doesn't always work that way. Another thing that's helpful is to make sure that these threads are lubricated when you're when you're doing this to make sure that uh, it spins nice and easily. And that looks like it's pretty flat down in there, so now we can back it back off. And you get to see the flare there. And all it does is kind of bunch up the material. When you do go in there for the final flare, you have a little bit of extra and it doesn't split the ends. And then you go in here with a second time and crank it down. And I did exactly what I didn't want you guys to do. Just forget the nut on the end. Because you cannot get it on now. 
All right, so we got our flare all finished up there, so it looks pretty good, and it looks like it's going to steal no problems. Um, we did have a couple of failed attempts. Make sure you do some test flares first, and you have uh, a good idea what you're doing before you do it, because they don't always come out right. However, uh, we're going to go put this back on the car, put our little clip back in. We're going to do the same thing to the other, the other line, and I also went ahead and put our adapters on here that we got from Summit, so we actually are going from the transmission side right here here looks like that it's got the little clip to hold it in place and then we will go all the way down to here which is a dash 6 an uh, fitting which is uh, gonna go to our stainless at that point and then we're going to uh, run our lines and get the right lengths that we need in order to make sure that we don't have too much access to have this all go back in together all right, so this is our bottom fitting right here, and our top one is way up here. I already have the little clips put back inside of the channels here. I did have to take this piece off in order to get the clip back in it. It was pretty difficult to maneuver up in here. Now that the clips are back in place, this is going to make things much easier because now we can just get our line up here and line it right up. Put it like this and basically just pop it in place and you can feel it clipping can't pull it back out it's in there so we got one in now we got our bottom one as well yeah yeah it's gonna be facing just like this and it did get bent a little bit i had a feeling when i was working on this it bent a little bit so i'm gonna bend this back a little bit and then we're gonna stick it right in there all right, so we just decided to throw a little coat of paint on this. I didn't really like the way it looked silver, so we had some paint sitting around. We just threw a quick coat of paint on it, just for aesthetics. If you do do that, make sure you cover your holes so you don't get any paint on your threads or anything. So, One of the things that uh, I read is that when you're going to go and cut one of these AN-style lines is to use an angle grinder with some tape around it. That way you don't fray any of the stainless braiding because you really need that in order to do the next step. So I'm going to cut that real quick. Uh, this is actually how it came. They sent it to me with a little bit of tape on the end. So I'm just going to trim it off to make sure I get a nice clean cut. All right. And you see how it's kind of like bowed out there a little bit? I guess that makes it a decent cut. Doesn't look too bad. All right, so let me grab a fitting and then we'll go ahead and start putting it on here. All right, so back in the beginning, I showed you guys these black fittings that I purchased. Um, these are actually for a different type of line. This is just a two piece fitting and is for the rubber uh, AN lines. So uh, unfortunately, that's not what I ordered. I ordered the PTFE lines, which is typically used for fuel. So it's a harder plastic line inside, it's Teflon coated. And these are the actual fittings that you need for that, and these are three piece fittings. So there's a little ferrule, and then there's the nut and the actual AN piece. And these ones go on a little bit different, so we're gonna put uh, one right on here and show you how to do it. So next we're gonna have to put the ferrule in here and uh, we have to get it up inside between the braided steel line and the plastic, so. You just kind of have to separate it a little bit. Actually, before you do that, you're going to want to put the put this on. It's going to make things a lot easier in the long run to get this on now. We have to take everything back off. We need to separate this just a little bit in here so we can get that ferrule in there. And just kind of use a little screwdriver or a pick and peel that away. You don't want to get any of those metal pieces between the ferrule and the plastic. You want to make sure that this is right on the plastic. If it does, it's guaranteed to leak. It kind of hurts to press it in a little bit with my bare hand. But you basically want to get it flush. That looks pretty good, I think. So you get that flush, and then you come in with uh, the last piece right here. And we have to get it down inside of this one, so just like that. And then this is what it should look like before you put the last piece on. Tighten this up. You want to make sure you get it in there good. Actually, a little bit of oil on this is probably going to be helpful. I'm just going to put a little bit of black tape around this right here so I can put it in the vise and not damage it. Now I'm just going to start tightening this down. This is aluminum so you don't really want to go too far because you can strip it. Overall it's a pretty clean looking fitting. I'm going to actually line up these faces right here and right here just to make it look nicer. I know that's what they do in like the pro shops so let's try and do that. 
Kind of like that. Makes it look a little bit more professional. Alright, so now that we have these in place where we want them, we're going to be able to figure out our exact lengths. So I'm going to go down below and just put some tape in the locations where I want to make my cuts. And then pull these back out, make the cuts, put them back in, call it a day. Alright, so we got our lines ran. Uh, we have an aluminum radiator here, so when we go to tighten this down, we got to make sure we hold on to this, uh, the fitting on the radiator, because we can bend it. So, I'm just going to crank this down. It's aluminum, like I said, so not too tight as to damage anything here. Alright, we got all our lines on, tightened it up. I put some zip ties in, kind of hold it in place, and made sure nothing was rubbing. Uh, we're going to start up, make sure it's not leaking now, and then take it for test drive. Alright, battery was dead. We're trying to take two. What? So I don't see anything leaking. Alright. Alright, hopefully you guys can hear me. This thing's not quiet. Uh, supposedly this uh, transmission has a thermostatic bypass, so I don't know if it's pumping any fluid to the cooler right now. Um, so we're going to take it for a drive, make sure we warm it up, and uh, check it for leaks a couple of times to make sure that it's all okay. All right, well, we got back from our little test drive and we got no leaks. Uh, she's definitely warm up here. So you can tell that the transmission is opened if it's got a thermostatic bypass. I don't really know for sure, but it's uh, it's doing good. We're gonna put the front end back on and uh, it should be good to go. Guys, thanks for watching. Please like, comment, subscribe, and stay tuned for more Jeep videos.